Welcome. This is Jeff from Men Physical Therapy. And today we're going to be talking about the second part of our lecture series on running related injuries. The first part was how to prevent those injuries or reduce that risk of injuries. And the second part is going to be about how do we take care of these injuries once they take place. So if we do um, have a running related injuries like patellofemoral pain, IT band issues, Achilles tendinopathy, or plantar heel pain, what are the most important self-management strategies to work on to help reduce the pain and get back to pain-free running. So thanks again for listening. This is Jeff with MEND, and we'll get started. So if you didn't um, recognize from the first lecture, MEND is a sports medicine practice here in Boulder, Colorado, where we specialize in treating athletes of all different types, including endurance athletes like runners. We really pride ourselves on getting people better in fewer visits. So we're not gonna take 10, 12, 16 visits to get someone better with a sports-related injury but we're going to be on top of it right away because we pride ourselves on being great problem solvers to both identify what's the tissue that's causing your pain and what are the contributing factors to that tissue. Is there an associated impairment of weakness or mobility or a training error or gait mechanics? Something that we can work on together to get you better faster. Again, identifying the underlying or root cause of the injury. You can find out more information about our practice at mendcolorado.com. So, Running is a very popular sport, especially here in Boulder, Colorado, where we see a lot of athletes take place in running. And with the running that they do, it's a very easy access point where it doesn't require much training. It only really requires a pair of running shoes. But despite all these advances in running, with more runners running, with more technology like running, gait analysis, and shoes, and clothing, we still see a high rate of running-related injuries, with up to 90% of all runners reporting a running related injury in their career that impacted their ability to train or compete at the level they desired. So one of the most common risk factors of having a running related injury is having a prior injury. And oftentimes runners return to running after having an injury without rehabilitating their body back to 100%. And that can set them up for another injury in the same area or another an injury in an adjacent area. So we find that when most runners return, they don't quite get back to the same level of running. They're not able to train as hard. They're not able to compete as hard. If they were once a marathon runner, now they're going to be becoming a half marathon runner or maybe a 10K runner. So in this presentation, we'll be talking about really the four most common running-related injuries. Thinking about knee pain, thinking about Achilles tendinopathy, that's something we used to call Achilles tendinitis, plantar heel pain, and also IT band syndrome. Most of these running-related injuries will occur due to the common injury pathway of overuse, where the load or the volume of our training exceeds the tissue's capacity to adapt and recover. And if we don't give that tissue time to adapt and recover, that overload can create an injury pattern. Just like you can imagine with the best example probably out there is for bone. If we were to load a bone with exercise, we can expect more bone density and a stronger bone. But if we don't give that bone enough time to recover, or we load the bone too much too fast, that's when we can develop a stress reaction, stress fracture. So we want to try to load tissues properly to give them time to recover and train to avoid that common pathway of injury. We can also see a overload injury by taking a tissue like the plantar fascia and loading it too much, more than it was designed to tolerate, which develops more of an overuse pattern as well. And we may be overloading the plantar fascia because other adjacent areas are not doing their job. So the ankle is not bending properly, the intrinsic muscles of the foot have become weak, which causes that overload of the plantar fascia. So a lot of times you can ask, how long would this injury take to get better? And on average, if you look at this study, it can take about two months for a running-related injury to get better. So it's a long time, and we want to spend our time on prevention. That was the goal of the first talk. But if the injury does take place, we can have reasonable expectations for how long this injury is going to take place to get better. And if anybody is telling you they're going to get better quickly with a tendon injury or a running-related injury, I'd be very cautious about that and ask good questions because you know, if you look at the data, it can be sometimes a slow process, especially in a tendon, to get that patient better. It's not going to be in a one-visit kind of magic wand type treatment. So with different running-related injuries, we can kind of incorporate our impairments into two broad categories thinking about a mobility category, what does the joint need from a range of motion or flexibility standpoint, and also from a stability standpoint, uh, what are the areas we need to work on from a weakness perspective. 
Um, oftentimes we'll see these two categories interplay with these different diagnoses that we'll talk about today. The areas that are further away from the center of the body often require mobility, and areas that are closer to the body often require more strength or stability. So thinking about a patient with patellofemoral pain, they may require mobility at the ankle, but they oftentimes require more strength or stability at the hip and the core. So patellofemoral pain is the most common reason you seek out care for a hip, knee, or ankle issue. It's also the most common running-related injury, with about one in four runners, excuse me, one in four injured runners will be diagnosed with patellofemoral pain. We see that the issue is twice as likely in females versus males, and it doesn't have a great prognosis on its own. If we just were to follow this over time and just kind of use a wait and see approach, up to 90% of patients that have this pain will still be symptomatic at four years. One of the main mechanisms behind the pain is an increase in compression and friction under the kneecap where it connects into the thigh. And as our knee moves inward underneath our hip, like we might demonstrate with poor running mechanics, we begin to weight bear over a smaller surface area underneath the kneecap. And that smaller surface area is going to have the same amount of loading from our body weight. And if we put that weight over a smaller surface area, we get higher joint reaction forces, higher pressure, and that's going to create the patellofemoral pain process. Most patients are going to describe pain around the kneecap or under the kneecap, and they're going to describe painful activities that would involve loading of the knee joint, like squatting, kneeling, descending stairs, in addition to the higher level activities like jumping and running. Some patients may also describe pain with prolonged sitting. If they've been doing a lot of computer work or a lot of uh, maybe watching a movie, having your knee at a 90 degree bend can increase the contact area between the kneecap and the thigh, and that can create aggravation of the joint. As we mentioned, we can see distal impairments of mobility. If you look at this picture on the left, when the knees move to the inside, that's the valgus position that we're mentioning, which increases the pressure under the kneecap. And a lot of patients that have limited ankle bend will demonstrate that and when you elevate their heels with a two by four or maybe a weight plate, that's gonna help improve the mechanics of the knee because you're just giving the ankle more room to move. So some runners that come in test strong, they've got good hip strength, they have good knee strength, but the, maybe the reason why they have valgus is because they have a loss of ankle bend. Now for the runners that have adequate bend at the ankle, we move up the chain and we often see hip weakness and quadricep weakness. So if we look at the treatments for this based on the clinical practice guidelines, our experts in the field recommend a few things. First, you can use an off-the-shelf orthotic. This would not be a custom orthotic. This would be something you could buy from a running store. And it's about one-tenth the cost of a, off the, a custom orthotic but with equal benefits. So there's no additional benefit of having a custom orthotic unless you have an atypical foot. If you have a, a more atypical foot on the flat side or the high arch side, you might benefit from an orthotic that's more custom, but otherwise you can use a short-term orthotic for about four to six weeks to help control the amount of foot motion that you have or pronation, which is associated with this knee valgus angle. So again, we use this for the short term as we wait for the hips to get stronger and for the knees to get stronger. The other thing we can work on is gait retraining. If you look at this picture on the right, we can see that the female's hips slope down from the right to the left, and her knees move closer together. And as that occurs, we increase the loading across the patellofemoral joint, where the kneecap is, because we weight bear over a smaller surface area. What the research has shown is that working on gait retraining with a the physical therapist that we discussed in the first lecture can make a big difference with loading the knee properly and reducing the forces at the knee, in particular by reducing the step length and improving the step frequency with how many steps you take in a given minute. If we look at the phase one strengthening, we're going to watch a video here, and all the videos that we're going to show are on our YouTube page. So if you search for youtube.com, and you type in Men Colorado, you'll find all the videos that we're going to discuss today. So we'd start with kind of a phase one strengthening exercise, working on hip strength, trying to keep our knees about hip width apart to work on alignment, and you can use that band around your knees to help remind those glutes what to do. So a bridge is a great starting exercise. And if that becomes easy, you can move into a hip thrust. So doing the bridge on the ball helps improve the activation of the glute max muscle. Now where you start depends on where you are here in your recovery. So if you're early on in your recovery, you wanna pick a low level exercise. If you're beyond that, and you're getting into the higher level parts of your recovery, you're gonna choose a higher level exercise. So I strongly recommend that you work with a physical therapist 
to determine where you are in the recovery process and what's the most appropriate exercise. So transitioning there to the single leg bridge, and then working into the glute medius exercises. So these are the muscles that are on the outside of the hips to help control the alignment of the knee when we run. This is gonna be involved with things like patellofemoral pain and IT band pain, even tendon issues at the knee like in the quad tendon and the patellar tendon. We wanna work on strengthening of the hip to control the alignment of the knee. On this exercise, we're gonna have it against the wall, working on the long lever hip abduction. So heels against the wall and butts against the wall. Now we can also take those two body weight exercises and add a band to add some more resistance. So we can work on the clamshell for added resistance, and then we can work on the hip abduction for added resistance too. So both those are excellent exercises to progress from body weight into a larger challenge of using the band. So you would choose the one that feels challenging to you. And then remembering that when we run, we land with about two to four times body weight. So if we can transition into a body weight exercise, that's a more effective way to train those muscles that are involved with running. So you're gonna see that we transition into a side plank here statically and then moving into this dynamic movement where we lower our hips towards the floor and then lift back up. So the side plank is a great two for one. We can work on the core as well as the hip at the same time. Now if we look at IT band pain, this would be either be the second or third most common reason why somebody would have um, a running related injury, making up about 15% of all running related injuries. This is another friction issue where we see friction between the IT band which is a long fibrous connective tissue that runs on the outside of your thigh from your hip down to the outside of your knee. And when we move our knee from a straight position to a bent position of about 20 to 30 degrees, that's where the friction can occur, especially when the knee is moving into a valgus position where the knee moves to the inside end of the hip. When you combine those two things, valgus and that 20 to 30 degree angle, that's where the friction takes place. And if you look at the average runner taking 180 steps per minute, those um, repetitions can add up quickly when you're running a three to five mile training run or race. So what we see as a risk factor for this is primarily mechanics. When people have poor mechanics when their foot hits the ground, that can precipitate the injury pattern where they enter the common injury pathway from poor mechanics. So what we want to try to do for this type of pain pattern is improve gait mechanics and improve strength. But what you will see out there is a lot of runners rolling their IT band. And it hurts like crazy and you think, man, if it hurts this bad, something good must be happening. But we don't find that that's the case, that the juice is not worth the squeeze in this, in this case. When we look at mobility of the IT band, it's a very strong structure and it can take up to 2,000 pounds of force to take it 1% of its length. So it's not gonna move by cupping or needling or my hands or any type of other intervention. The best way to get it moving is probably to address the surrounding soft tissue. And when we look at the randomized controlled trials here, if we had one group roll their IT band and a second group roll the surrounding tissue like the outer quad or the TFL called the tensor fascia lata muscle at the hip, that's the group that tends to improve its mobility. The IT band group does not improve its mobility. So again, don't waste your time rolling the IT band. Instead, really work on your gait mechanics to improve your loading of the knee at foot strike and then work on your hip strengthening, in particular, the glute medius muscle. So oftentimes we see that the TFL is doing too much work for people, the muscle in the front pocket, and if that muscle is doing too much work, that can tension or compress the IT band against the femur. So gait retraining, like we mentioned, for patellofemoral pain, if we can keep the pelvis level and we can keep the knees apart, oftentimes by shortening the stride length and having the patient land softer, that's a great cue to get people from a heel strike position into a midfoot strike position. So we'll watch that in the next video here. If we look at the video on gait retraining, the two broad categories of running would be a heel strike technique and a midfoot strike technique. So with a heel strike technique here, we see a longer stride, more forces across the knee, and for a weak runner, it's harder to absorb those forces and you end up with bad mechanics. If you're a strong runner, you can probably compensate for bad mechanics or for a heel strike pattern. So for that injured runner, if we can give them a cue to land softer, that'll get them into more of a midfoot strike position, reduce the forces across the knee, and help improve the mechanics of the knee joint to avoid the friction between the IT band and the bony prominences at the knee. So gait retraining is an excellent way to improve IT band issues.
So as we get past the phase one exercise we did for patellofemoral pain, those can also be indicated for IT band issues. We can get into the more advanced exercises that we'll see here. What are the top exercises for the glute medius? So we see that there's the top five from the study by Mike Ryman. The first one you recognized before, which is the hip abduction, raising lower against the wall. So a great place to start. Again, it may not be appropriate for every person. I can't stress that enough. But based on your own individual tolerance and your own individual case, some of these might be great starting points for you. So this one here, we're going to use a sloping down towards the floor and then driving it back up with the left hip. It looks very similar to the gait retraining video, taking it from a sloped position to a level position at the pelvis. So single leg deadlift, we're going to see some crossover now between the glute medius exercises and the glute max exercises. If we can work on the glute medius here with a single leg deadlift, we can keep the knee at a 20 to 30 degree bend, similar to what we'd find for the friction of the IT band, but instead he's working on keeping that knee straight ahead. So you're working on control of the knee as well as strengthening of the muscles of the hip. So both the glute medius and what we'll also find in the next video for glute max. So a single leg squat would not be for all runners, but for some runners who are more advanced, who have less severity and less irritability in their knee, it could be an excellent exercise to work on control of the knee as well as hip and knee strengthening at the same time. So again, we'll see some crossover here between the glute medius and the glute max. And then finally, the, the best one for activation of the muscle based off this Mike Ryman study was the side plank. So if we move into the glute, the glute max, we'll look at the next video from our YouTube website. And we'll see the top five for the glute max. So these are all kind of based on, again, another study looking at EMG activation was the retro step up was number one. So going up with the uninvolved side and then lowering eccentrically or negatively with the involved side. So we're going to use a hinge. This is a 16 inch step. It doesn't have to be that tall. And depending on how low level you were, you could start with a four inch step or a five inch step and then transitioning into the wall ball squat. So another excellent exercise to work on hip and knee development and strength, but getting back into that single leg squat like we mentioned as a runner, where you're absorbing two to four times your body weight each time you land on the ground, you know how to make sure that your hip and knees are strong enough to tolerate that load. If not, we're going to develop that overuse pattern as we load tissues abnormally. Here's our single leg deadlift that we saw in the glute medius video. So great one for both max and medius, so if you're short on time because of life and family and work, you can work on just a single exercise for that same benefit of both muscle groups. And then the final exercise we'll get into is a step up. Like I mentioned, it doesn't have to be a 16 inch step. It could be a eight to 10 inch step you might have at your house, like in your stairs. It could be your curb. It could be the step into your house or apartment. It could use a smaller step and that would be less intensity, obviously. With this, we're gonna use a forward lean at the hip. So we're gonna hinge at the hip as we step forward and that's gonna help us engage that glute max muscle. How about knee arthritis? We talked about this a lot in the first video that we really changed our mind about running in knee arthritis. That the research so far has shown that running history, if you had been a runner, is not associated with the development of knee arthritis. So we don't have to stop running for fear that we're gonna develop knee arthritis. In fact, when you look at Recreational runners compared to their sedentary peers, recreational runners have about one third the incidence of knee arthritis compared to their sedentary peer. One group that we might have a higher incidence are professional runners who are running multiple marathons per year. And that high training volume might make them more susceptible to knee arthritis with an incidence around 13%. Um, when we look at knee arthritis, it's gonna happen to all of us. All of our joints are gonna age over time, starting in about age 30. Now what determines if you're gonna be symptomatic or non-symptomatic would be the amount of strength that you have. And if we look at this picture on the right, this hiker, if you look at his left quad, he has got nice definition, nice bulk in the muscle, we can assume that that's a strong quad. If we look at the right side, there's some atrophy, some flattening, less definition of that quad. And despite these knees having the same age and the same number of miles on them, the right one might be more symptomatic because it's the weaker leg. So again, because we have arthritis on an x-ray, it is not a direct correlation or a direct effect on having pain. A lot of people can have arthritis and not have pain, 
And in fact, in the older population, we see that if we took x-rays of all of our parents or grandparents, we might find arthritis. But then about 70% of those people will remain asymptomatic and will not have pain. So the main muscle we're going to go after for these patients is oftentimes the quad. And the exercise becomes the foundation and bedrock of a treatment approach. And again, like the other issues we talked about before, and really everything we're going to cover in this talk, physical therapy remains the first-line treatment for knee arthritis. That they can do very well with physical therapy, especially an approach involving manual therapy, where we mobilize stiff joints, we reduce the pain across the kneecap and across the main hinge joint of the knee, and combine that with high-level exercise. And that approach combined has been shown to delay or prevent the need for a knee replacement down the road. If we use more of a multimodal approach and really incorporate ex education, exercise, manual therapy, and sometimes weight loss, that might be our best approach to keeping somebody running. Again, running is not going to be something that we're going to stop in a patient with knee arthritis. It has not been shown to worsen the x-ray radiological evidence of arthritis, and it may have a protective effect by improving the circulation to that knee joint and improving the circulation to the cartilage. So as we look at quadricep strengthening in this video, we can start with a open chain exercise where we're not laboring with the ground by looking at straight leg raising. And as he pulls up into the band with his foot, that's going to help him engage that quadricep muscle. So you could do it without weight, you could do it without a band, but if you wanted more of a challenge, you could wear a heavier shoe or a heavier boot as you go through that exercise piece. So oftentimes we find that if we combine that open chain with some more weight-bearing exercises, it's a very effective way to help train the quad. So in this Spanish squat, he's got a band around both knees, and as he goes into his little air squats here, that's going to help him work on his quadricep control as he pushes back into the band and engages that quadricep muscle. So starting again with both feet in contact with the ground, and then we'll see him progress into single leg exercises, into a single leg squat as he engages that quadricep muscle by pushing straight back into extension and then incorporating what we learned already about the glutes into more of a step-up exercise. So you can incorporate the step-up by engaging that quadricep muscle. So again, for knee arthritis, we're going to work really hard on strengthening that quadricep muscle. It's the main shock absorber for the knee joint. How about Achilles tendon pain? So that's an area that has also changed it's been shown to be maybe the second most common or the third most common running related injury. And we see that the main risk factors for Achilles tendon pain is a lack of ankle bend or dorsiflexion, as well as calf weakness. If the calf becomes weak, it cannot shield the Achilles tendon from the forces of running. And for a midfoot striker, the calf is so important to absorb forces. And if you're running with a weak calf, that can cause Achilles tendon pain. This could be a runner that we could shift towards a longer stride and get them into a longer stride, which can decrease the loading of the calf and Achilles, and that might help them into the short term as they return to running. This is something we used to call an itis. We used to call it Achilles tendonitis because we thought there might be a lot of inflammatory cells in the tendon. Things like ibuprofen and rest and wearing a boot might be indicated, and that was back then. But if we look at the current research, we know that there's not inflammatory cells in the tendon, but there's more of a cell turnover taking place. And that cell turnover is where these old injured cells are being replaced by new, healthy, but immature cells. And these immature cells do not have the same tensile strength as strong, healthy tone. So we want to try to help remodel those cells from an immature state back into a mature state with exercise, including running and strength training. That's probably the best way to get that tendon to remodel under constant load. If we just leave it alone and do nothing, it might feel better because you're doing nothing. But as soon as you get back into running, it's still going to hurt because the tendon is still immature and the muscle is still weak. So if we look at this remodeling process, it can take a long time. Sometimes up to 10, 12 months, even up to two years to help improve that remodeling of the tendon where it becomes more stiff, where it reduces its thickness, and it becomes more mature. If we look at the picture here on the right, where the arrow is, the yellow arrow, that's more of a mid-portion Achilles tendinopathy. That would be one that would respond well to strengthening and remodeling through a full range of motion. Conversely, if you have pain where the tendon inserts into the bone by the heel, that will not do as well off a stair. So if you're doing exercises off the stair and your pain's at the heel, it's not going to do well because you're adding more compression and friction against that part of the Achilles tendon. You would be better off strengthening from the floor 
up onto your toes. So that'd be the main difference with strengthening for a mid-portion Achilles tendinopathy or an insertional tendinopathy. Again, in the short term, we can expect improvements in about 8 to 12 weeks because the calf gets strong enough to shield the Achilles tendon. And a lot of athletes will stop there. They'll say, yeah, it's not feeling painful anymore. They kind of lose that motivation to exercise, and then the pain returns. And what tended to happen was that the muscle was strong enough to compensate, but the tendon was still weak. And so if you want to reduce the pain and get rid of it for good, you want to try to strengthen up to 12 months, and that'll be your best chance to reduce that risk of recurrence of the tendon. So you can, again, promote that full tendon remodeling. So we can start with the ones you probably found on the internet. Looking in the internet, you'll find heel raises based on that Alfredson protocol from the mid-90s. But we know now that we want to try to just strengthen the tendon as well as the surrounding tissue as well. So thinking about how do we incorporate the hip, how do we incorporate the knee along with that tendon. And that's where we get to this triple extension that we'll see in this next video. So starting with more basic exercises. So we're doing basic exercises here, looking at calf strengthening with both legs. And then we'll get to strengthening with just one foot. So we'll kind of go up with both legs and then we'll lower with one leg. So we kind of get into more of an eccentric loading as we transition into the single leg here. So up with both and then using the negative with just a single leg. So it's a great stepping stone from using two legs to just using one leg for the calf strengthening and helping remodel that tendon. Then moving into single leg up and down, so we're not using the right leg at all. We're using just the involved side. And then what we'll do is we'll transition from this ankle exercise into the same ankle strengthening involving the hip and the knee. So we can use triple extension. We have the hip in extension, the knees in extension, our heel. So heel comes up, lowers back down. Then we use triple extension with a step up. This will help us with the push off phase of the gait. So squeeze the glute as we drive it up. So again, incorporating what we know about the hip, what's best for the glute max, what's best for the glute medius, as we also work on the ankle. So you get a nice three for one special here. And the final one would be a reverse lunge with triple extension. So again, think about how do we keep those areas moving? And as far as tips for the tendon, I can kind of just give you some recommendations is to be patient. These do take time and then often have relapses that occur along the way. You're not gonna see a straight perfect line between time and recovery. It's gonna have some relapses and have some recurrences and that's totally normal as you get stronger. You can also expect to have some mild pain. So you can expect to have maybe a one, two or three on a scale of zero to 10. That's normal too. When you finish the exercise though, you should quickly return back to baseline, kind of how it felt before you started. If it lingers on the rest of that day, into the evening, into the, the nighttime hours, we want to try to back off our volume. But some mild pain when you do the exercise, that's very normal for an injured tendon that's trying to heal. So plantar fasciitis is something that we used to call pain underneath the bottom of the foot. Thinking about that passive structure, the plantar fascia that runs from the heel into the ball of the foot. It's a very strong structure. It's similar to the Achilles tendon that when we biopsy this area, we don't notice any inflammatory cells. And again, we see this cell turnover taking place and we don't call it fasciitis anymore. And we don't utilize anti-inflammatory interventions like medications or a boot. We tend to utilize more things that involve more of an active approach to help promote the remodeling process of the injured plantar fascia. You also want to try to look at what are some of the contributing factors that cause the plantar fascia to get overloaded in the first place. One of the things that's commonly out there is a lack of ankle bend. If you've lost ankle mobility, that'd be another reason why we can increase the flattening of the arch, which would increase the stress on the plantar fascia. In addition to the lack of ankle bend, you can also see a weakness in the core musculature of the foot, where the intrinsic muscles that you saw in the video on the first presentation can become weak So again, this can be the third or sometimes the fourth most common running related injury in patients. So for this video here, we're going to look at ankle mobility. And this is a very easy exercise to do at home where you can put a band around the ankle and then working on the mobility of the shin over the foot. 
So as he rocks forward into the motion, he's going to rock forward and back over about a 30 to 60 second window. This is a great exercise to do before you run as you try to work on your mobility of the ankle, trying to keep the heel down in contact with the floor, kneecap straight ahead, and try to prevent your arch from flattening as you go through the movement. So work on your alignment of the knee as you rock in and out of that exercise. What we can also do is increase the demands of the ankle. So kind of imagine like you're running uphill and you need to have more ankle bend. That's what we can do here. You can use a half foam roller, you can use a towel roll, you can use a book, something under the front of the foot to prop it up. And that's gonna let you work into a end range position for the ankle, more dorsiflexion. And then finally, we'll work into more of a runner's position. So kind of working into a runner's mobility stretch where the band is around the ankle as you rock in and rock out to try to mobilize that ankle joint before you run. So again, all these are on our website. Please take a look along with the intrinsic videos. Finally, what we're going to look at is some of our top running related exercises. You'll probably see some things you recognize in the previous slides and previous videos. But what we know is for strength training, we can reduce that risk of injury by 50% to two thirds if you're a strong runner. So if we take two runners, one runner strong, one runner only does running, the person who only does running is at a much higher risk of injury than the runner who is strong. And some of the common reasons you wouldn't do strength training as a runner that you hear in the running groups is you don't wanna put on mass or bulk. And that's been really disproven with the research in runners looking at strength training. They've improved strength, they've improved running performance and running economy, but they have not changed their body mass. So I'll just say that again, they have not changed their body mass. There is not a risk of bulking up. What you're going to find is you're going to become a stronger, more resilient. Incorporate strength training, thinking about a squat and a hinge and a core exercise and plantar flexion exercise, keeping those four categories in your program. And again, I would refer you to the first lecture, first presentation, or to our YouTube page for some of these common exercises there. So one final slide I'll talk to you guys about is how do you know if you're doing too much? How do you know if you're doing too little? And the soreness rows are a great way for you to monitor the tissue that you're going after and trying to treat. It could be the patellofemoral joint. It could be knee arthritis. It could be the Achilles tendon. It could be the plantar fascia. But you need to keep track of how the symptoms feel during your activity and also after the activity as you're into your recovery phase. If you have soreness that develops during the warm-up and continues throughout the run and it never really increases, it doesn't really decrease, you're probably one level too high. And you need to take a couple days off, reduce your level by 10 or 20%, and then do a second run and see how that soreness feels. If the soreness develops during the warm-up and then goes away, you're probably at the right level, but you just need to do more runs at that level before you progress. Um, conversely, if you have soreness that develops not during the run, but it comes on maybe the next day or that evening, you probably need to take one day off and at least get two or three more runs in at that same level before you make any progression to make sure that tissue is adapting and healing. And then finally, if you got through your run, you had no pain, no soreness, you can probably increase your volume by about 10 or 20% in the next week. And again, get two or three non-consecutive days of running in and see how it feels, and then make that progression. Slow and steady wins the race here. Allow your tissue time to adapt and recover before you make a progression. So just remember that doing too little is often as bad as doing too much. We want to try to find that sweet spot, and the only way you really know that is by getting an accurate diagnosis of what tissue is affected, and then also keeping track of your symptoms during your run and after. Here's our YouTube page with all of these references and resources that are on there. We have our videos. If you kind of search for Men Colorado on YouTube, you'll find our videos as well as our playlists. And these are all there for your reference. So please take a look. In summary, you need to have an accurate diagnosis first. We've got to figure out what's the injured tissue, what are the contributing factors. And the best way to do that in all of healthcare is to work with a physical therapist. I can't think of any other profession in healthcare that would help you identify both the injured tissue as well as the contributing factors, which mobility factors which stability factors. At MEND, we offer a free consultation. We can work with one of our physical therapists for an hour. You can come into the clinic for a free evaluation and a free treatment to get you on that path to recovery. That way you'll know which exercises are most appropriate for your condition. Um, given this COVID um, 
coronavirus pandemic that's going on. I understand the restrictions that are out there. So if you're listening to this video during that time, we also offer a online virtual consultation where you can also have 45 to 60 minutes with our therapists to really discuss what's the injured tissue and make that plan going forward. Oftentimes that plan will involve load management strategies and let you know how much running you can do, how much is too much, and how much is too little. For the vast majority of running related injuries outside of bone injuries like stress fractures and stress reactions, outside of those, loading is good and loading is helpful. It just has to be done in the appropriate manner. Finally, we can work on things like body, um, running mechanics to help reduce that loading process across the injured tissue, thinking about the IT band or patellofemoral pain patient. Finally, feel free to reach out. Our website is mencolorado.com. We're also on social media, including Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where you'll find more information about our practice, more information about injuries, and also great resources on how you can treat yourself with strength training, mobility work, at home. So please reach out. Thanks again for listening. And if you have any questions, please let us know. Hope to see you out there. Thank you.